name is Mike Bagley, and I'm really happy to be here um, today. When uh, Dr. Brereton called a couple weeks ago and invited me to uh, come and join you today, I was at first a little bit reluctant. Um, I had seen some of the videos from last year and, and saw the lineup of the speakers for this year, and I was a little bit intimidated. Um, you know, a lot of doctors and uh, people who had accomplished things. So I said to Andy when he, when he called, sure, I'll be happy to do it. Um, I'll be happy to do it, but I, I gave him a disclaimer, um, and it came from one of my favorite books ever. Um, and this is a real book, and I recommend it to you. It's called Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hunt, and it's partly tongue-in-cheek, but it's largely um, a serious book about drawing some lessons from the way Attila did his thing into the way you can do things in business. And the secret that most resonated with me was this one. He says, every hunt serves a purpose. Whoops. Again. Every hunt serves a purpose, even if it's just to set a bad example. Uh, so I will endeavor today to serve a purpose, and I'll ask you to be mindful that it might just possibly be a bad example. Uh, but we'll try and avoid that. So, as we've been, I've been thinking the last two weeks or so about this question, what is my dream? Um, it was a really, at first I thought it was going to be a simple question to answer, right? It seems like a fairly obvious, basic thing. What's, what do I care about? What's important to me? What's maybe the theme or the connective tissue that's woven through my life um, that's really been important to me. But when I started to think about it, and I'm sure this has happened for, for others in the audience, when you start to think about it, you start to realize maybe it's not that simple. And so thanks to some nice conversations with, with Andy and a lot of uh, time in the car, I live down in Ocean County, so I got about an hour and a half to commute each way, uh, a lot of contemplative time. I finally thought that I, uh, came to, to what I thought was the answer for me, and that's creating. And when I talk about creating, it's not really in the sense that you might think initially. Um, it's not painting, I'm not a very good, I'm not a painter at all. Um, I can't draw, um, I don't sing, I'm not a sculptor. And sometimes we think about creating in the sense of, of those artistic endeavors. Um, when I think about creating, I think about um, creating your life as a work of art. Um, bringing things into existence that you care about, that are in line with your highest ideals, that you just want to exist. They don't necessarily need to exist, but you want them to be there. And I've been fortunate enough over the years to encounter, and, and uh, in one case, live with some people who I consider to be incredible creators. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about them and then share with you some of the lessons that I've learned from them. The first is my father, meet Bill Bagley. Uh, this, by the way, is is a glimpse of what I'm going to look like in 27 years. <laughs> Run into each other. It's going to look remarkably similar to this. Um, my father is the smartest person I've ever met. Um, he's incredibly uh, intelligent. He's been successful in his career. He uh, went to a fine Jesuit institution called Holy Cross up in Worcester. Um, he graduated very close to the top of his class. He went in the Navy, became a naval officer. Uh, Toward the end of his Navy career, he uh, went to Harvard, a small little college up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, got an MBA, and moved out to New Jersey, started working on Wall Street. Shortly thereafter, became a partner uh, in a Wall Street firm. He had a beautiful home in, in southern Connecticut. He had, um, uh, you know, was making a nice living. He had four beautiful, unbelievably talented children, the eldest of which was really remarkable. <laughs> so he was living the dream. He was, he was um, you know, kind of, especially for people of his generation coming from, uh, you know, the, the uh, baby boomers, as they're now called, he was really doing what he was supposed to be doing. Um, he was being successful at what he was supposed to be doing. But what he found out in the mid-70s was that this is not what he wanted to be. This is not what he wanted to do. And now it's kind of a hip and cool thing to, to kind of break away from the mainstream and do different things. But if you think, for those of us that were alive back to the 70s, um, this is not a popular thing to do. But what he did was, on his 40th birthday, he said, enough is enough. This is not the life I want to live. Um, we heard, heard it from some people talking earlier about you know, wanting to spend time with their kids. Uh, wanted to have more of a life, and so he started to imagine what his life would look like. Um, he started doing consulting, which again is now the most common career for, for uh, many people, but back then was not. Uh, he worked from home for about three weeks until he discovered that having four children in the house was not, a, not conducive to having a home office. 
Um, and he began helping people create small businesses that they cared about, and in, in relatively short order, created the life um, that he wanted to create. He's not an artist, he's not a singer, he's not a painter, um, but in my mind, he was one of the most creative people that, that uh, I've ever been around. And he taught me the lesson when I was relatively young that you should create your life, you should make your life be that which you want it to be. About 10 years after he did that, I graduated from college and I went to graduate school down in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was not particularly suited for graduate school. Um, Seton Hall would not have sent me an application to apply, much less accepted my application when I sent it back. Um, I'm not an academic, I was not particularly happy, but I was in graduate school because I thought, well, that's probably a good thing to do. Through a series of circumstances and, and uh, coincidences, if you believe in such things, um, I was uh, decided to leave uh, graduate school and come and work with the company with which I'm now employed called Project Use, Urban Suburban Environments. And while I was there, I met one of the other uh, most amazing creators I've ever been around. His name is Phil Costello. Um, Project Use, by the way, as Clara aptly described, we're a nonprofit organization. We work with about 7,000 individuals a year. Uh, we're located just down the street in Newark, and um, we do a lot of different programs. I'll talk about some of them in a few minutes. Uh, in 1970, when Project Use began, our sole business was um, running wilderness programs. Uh, we ran an outward bound adaptive program. So we would uh, take kids out in the woods, we'd give them backpacks and sleeping bags and tents and um, schlep around the woods, go canoeing, go rock climbing, things like that. Phil, the co founder of Project Use, Jose Gonzalez, were teachers at Trenton Central High School. In the 1960s, they had an opportunity to go up to Hurricane Island in Maine, where outward bound was starting a school and do a teacher program where the teachers learn some of Outward Bound's tricks and uh, techniques. Phil and Jose went and uh, discovered the program, participated, got totally turned on to the idea of using the wilderness and nature as a way to bring kids together. Uh, they went back to Trenton, they started their program, they got some federal grant money to run it, it was wildly successful, and the Board of uh, Education, in their infinite wisdom, said, you're taking too much money for your program, we want it for some of our other programs, and they kicked them out. The path of least resistance for Phil and Jose would be, said, well, well, we tried, we had a couple of good years running, go back in the classroom, finish out their 30 years of teaching, and retire, right? What did they do? They quit. They said, we're not, this is what we want to do, we're going to start a nonprofit. And Phil's, one of Phil's favorite stories was when he went home to his then pregnant wife, Bobby, the day he quit and announced without any forewarning, guess what? I quit my job today. We're starting a nonprofit. Uh, he thought it was one of the best stories ever. She didn't think it was quite. <laughs> <laughs> and so they started Project Use. And over the years, for the next 35 years, Phil ran Project Use. And in those 35 years, he was one of the most innovative, creative educators in the state of New Jersey. We run programs for schools. Most of our clients are schools. We created and developed programs for the Juvenile Justice Commission, um, turning um, incarcerated programs for incarcerated kids, which essentially were, were warehouses. We actually took them out in the woods and uh, for 30 days at a time on ex expeditions and taught them about leadership and community building and problem solving and conflict resolution. Um, and Phil and Jose, uh, but largely Phil, developed those programs over the years. If he had stayed in the classroom, he would probably would have done some creative things, probably would have done some interesting things, but by following his dream and following his passion, uh, getting out into the world um, and creating Project Use, he lived a real creative life. A great example, and one that impacted me tremendously, um, of Phil's um, creativity and his outlook. Uh, in 1992, he took us down to uh, Chesapeake Bay to do a Pro, a staff training program on a pulling boat, which is an open boat, it's about a 22 foot um, open sailboat. Um, and 12 of us were on board for a week in, in November in the Chesapeake Bay. It was freezing cold. I've never been as cold in, in my life as I was that week. Um, but it was one of the best weeks we ever had. And, and during the week, I realized that sailing was something that I wanted to bring to New Jersey and use, do the same thing we were doing in the woods on sailboats. So after a couple of months of thinking about it, I went to Phil and I said, Hey, I got an idea. I think we need to include sailing in our program. He said, that's great. And I said, I think we should have a program on Barnegat Bay. We should have some sailboats available for kids to come get on board. He said, I think that's terrific. I said, okay, so we can do it? He said, yep. Yeah. this is easy. He said, but you have no money, and you have to continue to do all your responsibilities that you're currently, uh, currently have to take care of. But otherwise, you can do it. And sure enough, two years later, 
we had four donated boats, we had marina space that was donated, and we were taking kids out on Barnegat Bay on a fairly regular basis, uh, helping them learn through sailing about leadership and teamwork and the environment and, and uh, those kinds of things. It's a great example for me of you don't need money, you don't need a million dollars in grants, you don't need to have all the time in the world. We're never going to have enough of any of those things, but with the right initiative and, and focused on what you want and passion for the thing that you want to create, it's going to come to be uh, come to, to fruition. Swap four small sailboats didn't seem to be enough for me. About three years later, um, some friends and I, a friend of mine and I, were sitting in a diner one day after sailing and uh, started talking about, imagine if we had a bigger boat. Imagine instead of a bunch of small boats where we take four or five kids at a time, what if we had a big boat where we could put everybody on at the same time? Imagine if this boat was a big schooner, big wood boat, traditional rig, lots of sails. <clears throat> at the time, we didn't know anything about big boats. I had just barely gotten my captain's license. Um, we talked about, imagine if it was in the Chesapeake Bay, neither of us lived near the Chesapeake Bay. There's a lot of good reasons <laughs> not to do this. But, two years later, the Schooner Imagine was born on, uh, in May of 1997. Um, we figured out a way, we started talking to people who knew things about boats, and they shared with us what they did. We started talking to people, um, bankers, who knew something about the Small Business Administration and, and loans um, that, that uh, you can get through the SBA. Uh, we started talking, TJ, my partner actually moved down to Annapolis a couple years before this just to check it out and see what's going on down there. And in a relatively short period of time, we were able to bring this beautiful ship into, into creation and use it as an educational platform and also a charter boat um, down in Maryland. <clears throat> I have to say, you hear a lot of stories. Uh, you hear the Apple story about a couple people in a garage and they're soldering things together and proof of uh, a computer was born. And um, in their 10 or 15 or 20 years later, the, the glamour of the story starts to get built up a lot, right? Sounds like this really great thing. When in reality, when they're slaving away, sweating away in the garage, it's not that glamorous. This one's pretty glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> this one is just as good as it looks. Um, so we created Imagine, and we did that for nine years. Um, in 2005, unfortunately, um, Phil passed away. Um, he had bone cancer, and uh, we fought for about 16 months to, to get rid of it. Um, couldn't and passed away, and so a couple months later, the board of trustees um, and asked me to come back and, and uh, join up with Project Use again, which I happily did. And at first, when I came to Project Use, I thought the uh, uh, my mission was to keep Phil's dream alive, to keep Phil's uh, legacy going, and, and that is an important mission. But what I really cared about, I found out, was creating um, a, a, a new Project Use or an ongoing, evolved Project Use. And so we've done a few things. I'll, I'll just mention one briefly. We started a boat building program in, uh, as if the world should have more boats, right? <laughs> we started a boat building program here in Newark and then it's expanded Jersey City and Asbury Park where, where we use the actual building of a boat to help kids learn and reinforce the skills that they're already learning in school like math, physics, um, history, literacy, and things like that. The program didn't exist a couple years ago. A few of us got together and said, wouldn't it? Imagine if we could build boats. Imagine if we used this boat building experience uh, for kids uh, to learn things that they're already supposed to be learning in school, but for some of us who learn a little bit differently, um, maybe this will help them get a little uh, better score on their tests, get a, a little bit, uh, get a little better grade in their class. So every May we launch five or six boats in the Passaic River, um, much to the shock and surprise of parents and teachers and everybody else who's watched these kids who they didn't necessarily know were capable of doing this, um, uh, make, build an actual boat and then launch it and go paddling. Um, so we've continued to create, again, Phil wasn't a singer, he wasn't a dancer, he wasn't a painter, but he taught us how to create. Um, so real quickly, um, what are some ways that you can create your own life and this is really what, what it's all about? Know what you want. Ask yourself the question all the time. What do I want my life to look like? What do I want to do? What do I want to be? Who do I want to surround myself with? What do you want to be when you grow up is not a rhetorical question. It's an actual, important question that you answer. And how do you know if you're there if you don't know where there is? If I said get in the car and drive for 200 miles, you could end up just about anywhere, right? A lot of times we get caught up in the process of doing something as a, without thinking necessarily about the end result. Ask yourself where there is and keep asking that question. <clears throat> Creating isn't about fixing a problem. I didn't build a schooner because I didn't have one. 
Painters don't paint because there's an abundance of blank canvases in the world. They paint because they love the creation that they're, that they're painting. I built a schooner because I love the idea of building a schooner. Don't look at all the things that, are, that you don't like about your life and turn them into, uh, try and fix them. Look at the things that you care about and try and bring them into, into creation. Um, tell yourself the truth about what's going on, and the truth isn't bad. When we didn't have any money, when we didn't know anything about big boats, when we didn't have an SBA loan, that wasn't bad. That was just the way it was. And we figured out ways to overcome some of those challenges. You can do the same thing. Don't dwell on the things or the reasons not to do things, but spend time thinking about what can I do to bring this thing that I really care about and really have passion about into into existence. Uh, take the leap of faith with the worst thing that have could happen. Uh, and then keep focusing on that which you want to bring into existence. Um, I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes. It's by James Mishner, and there's a word in this quote that I was a little reluctant to use until um, is it Kathy, she's still here? She dropped the S bomb and it gave me all the freedom <laughs> to do this. So, this is from James Mishner, and this is one of Bill's favorite quotes, and it, it is one of mine as well. I've recently decided that the constructive work of the world is done by an appallingly small percentage of the general population. The rest simply don't give a damn, or they grow tired, or they fail to acquire when young the ideas that would vitalize them for long decades. Those men and women who do have the energy to form new constructs and new ways to implement them must do the work of many. I believe it to be an honorable aspiration to want to be among those creators. The only question is, can you hang on through the crap they throw at you and not lose your freedom or your good sense? You can create your work of your life as a work of art, I guarantee you, and uh, I encourage you to do so. And I thank you for letting me be here with you today.